Good morning, and thank you for joining our forum, Money, Wealth, and Disparities, Agony to Action, Creating Inclusive Access. Again, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, the first ever chairwoman of the Financial Services Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion. I am delighted to serve as your moderator for our forum. Each year, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference brings together federal, state, local policymakers, business leaders, educators, students, and expert thought leaders in order for us to take a look at their ongoing efforts to achieve full economic, educational, and social inclusion in the United States. We are so fortunate to have MasterCard and McDonald's as our sponsors. I deeply appreciate their support and generous contributions to this year's forum. Their engagement speaks volumes to their corporate values. Thank you, McDonald's. Thank you, MasterCard. I want you to sit back and get ready because we're going to be live today. We're going to bring a lot of issues to the forefront. And I am so honored that today's forum brings together a panel of distinguished leaders who will identify both systemic barriers which have disadvantaged the growth and success of Black owned businesses and entrepreneurs, as well as they will provide us with some solutions to embrace and implement that we will be able to overcome many of these barriers. So we are joined today by Marla Blow. Marla is the Senior Vice President, North America Social Impact at MasterCard and is North American lead at the MasterCard Center for Inclusion Growth. She was featured in the April 2018 Vanity Fair, 26 Women of Color, Diversifying Entrepreneurship. And she is a Henry Crown Fellow as part of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. That means she is smart, she is strong, and she is strategic. The next panel list is a familiar voice who I am pleased to have back on our forum for another year. As a matter of fact, he has been with us for the entire time that I have been presenting this forum. No other than my friend, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, a professor of sociology at Georgetown and has taught at some of the nation's most distinguished universities, including Brown, UNC, Chapel Hill, and Columbia. Dr. Dyson is a gifted, best-selling author of more than 20 books, including volumes on Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Tupac, Marvin Gaye, and yes, Barack Obama. He earned a PhD in religion from Princeton University and is the author of the critically acclaimed Tears We Cannot Stop, Sermon to White America. You're in for a real treat, and it is my honor to take his place as the moderator, and this year, he is a panelist. So, Dr. Dyson, I'm in charge. <laughs> you always am. Andre Hill, owner, operator of Columbus, Ohio's McDonald's, yes, my hometown, and is a techpreneur. Andre has completed McDonald's rigorous second generation program and leads a startup called HiSee, whose platform seeks to increase equity for Black people through the United States. He is a graduate of Michigan State, won't hold that against him, and holds an MBA from Clark University. Clark Atlanta University, and is committed to creating economic opportunities for young people and their families. Dr. Dyson, watch out. He's also from Detroit. And our final panelist, Adrian Tremble, President and CEO of the National Minority Supplier Development Council, better known as NMSDC, 
She is known as a thought leader for advancing corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Prior to her role with NMSDC, Trimble was general manager of diversity inclusion at Toyota Motor North America, responsible there for leading and executing diversity and inclusion strategies across Toyota's North America operations. This sister recently testified before the United States Congress in my committee. Let me just leave it at this. She delivered and dropped the mic. Now, I want you to get ready to our audience. As you can see by my introductions, you're in for a real treat. I want you to know that I'm gonna ask a series of questions to the panelists. I want you to feel free to have a dialogue with each other as I moderate. That means I may interject at any time to ask you to hold that thought or to please continue. I'm going to start off by asking a question to each panelist. And the first question is, each of you are accomplished in your respective business endeavors as Black people and understand the challenges of the growing wealth gap and the persistent societal disparities our people are facing to become successful in business and in life. So here we go. Briefly share your agony to action story. That is, tell us your story about what critical things in your life propelled you to where you are today that would be instructive to our audience. Well, gentlemen, we're going to start with you. Dr. Dyson, we will let you start. And then Andre, you're on deck to follow Dr. Dyson. So we'll let the brothers go. And then ladies, we'll kind of help them out and be the cleanup. So <laughs> first question is to you, Dr. Dyson. Yes, ma'am. Uh, age before beauty here. Um, I am uh, honored to be here with Congresswoman Beatty, as usual, and don't get it twisted. Even when she ain't on program, she in charge. So don't even, don't even act like this the first time because she always in charge. Um, that's, a, that's an extraordinary question. You're absolutely right. We are living through unprecedented times in terms of the pandemic. We are living through unprecedented times in terms of the racial consternation and crisis that has been visited upon us as American citizens and the yawning abyss in each case beyond the issue of race has been the disparity between the resource base that African-American, Latinx people and other minorities can pull on and white America in this country. So the wealth gap is a persistent and yawning abyss that has divided us. The digital divide is a reference to the wealth gap. The ownership of homes is a reference to the wealth gap. The ability to go to whatever college you want is, a, is an index of the wealth gap. So that wealth gap is critical and it is persistent in this country. When I think about my own story, uh, one of five boys, immediately a larger family of nine uh, kids, my father working in an automobile industry as a wheel brake, uh, uh, at a wheel brake company where he was a master setup man, got laid off of work. Uh, my mother wasn't at that time working so he had f seven miles to feed. And so he started hustling on the street the proper way in terms of getting uh, a grass cutting and siding business with his five sons. And people used to laugh at us. Look at them Dyson boys. They always working. Yeah, that's where I get my work ethic from because my daddy taught me, uh, you got to make a way out of no way. Tupac said, you got to make a dollar out of 15 cent. My daddy was doing that, applying elbow grease and teaching us never to be discouraged by the lack of formal opportunity, but to make a way out of no way. But we were extremely, you know, we were poor. We were struggling. My father refused to go on welfare. He said, as long as I have ability in my body, I will work as hard as I can. We picked up steel off the street. We took it down to the uh, city to weigh it. We picked up cans. We, uh, uh, we, we painted houses. 
uh, we mowed lawns, we did everything we could to make sure that we could have something in the tank. And I've been working, I tell my children this, I sound like one of those old school comedians, I've been working since I've been 10 years old full time. After school, I would go to work in a nursery uh, and haul that wheelbarrow full of sod and those trees and plant stuff. And I did other uh, occupations in the informal uh, underground economy. I'm not sure of the statute of limitations. I'll leave it at that. So the reality is, is that I've been working hard from day one. And black people, most of us have been working hard from day one. So our agony was we were born in a country that looted us, that stole our wealth, that stole us as loot from Africa in 1619. 401 years later, here we are. And so I was able to leverage the intelligent, the assiduous, diligent, industrious ways of my father and my mother, who was the smartest woman I knew. Her father didn't believe that women of her age should have to go to school on a scholarship. So she was denied opportunity to take up a scholarship, a full ride to go to college. My mother's now what, 81, 82 years old and still reading and still doing her thing. But my agony was that we were against the economic barriers that were imposed upon us arbitrarily by a white supremacist culture that failed to recognize our humanity. But in Detroit, in that black city, in that bedwether of, and that benchmark of serious engagement, black genius rose up. I'm not saying I'm one, I'm saying the people around me were. So we had the first black mayor, we had the first lawyer, uh, Kenneth Cochran, who even before Johnny Cochran would call a white judge uh, uh, an epithet and live to tell about it. That's the kind of belief we had in ourselves. And so we believed in economic upward mobility. We believe in working hard and now, uh, uh, on this panel, I'm still the poorest person here. Don't get that twisted. I ain't in business, but I'm trying to get in your business. But I've been able to leverage what resources I have to be able to make a difference and to argue, as Congresswoman Beatty so brilliantly does, that we need to reduce the disparity in terms of home ownership, in terms of access to capital. And I spend my life trying to do that. People reward me handsomely for the ability to think critically. So it ain't just a rapper, it ain't just a singer, it ain't just a performer. You can have serious intelligence and make money like everybody on this panel shows. And so I've been trying to leverage that in defense of black people while also accumulating enough wealth to take care of my family so that we won't have to struggle the way my mother and father did. My story then is one of typical black America. You, you lower your pail where you are, like Du Bois said, but like, w, like, uh, like Booker T. Washington said, but like Du Bois said, you got to get the goods up here. And that's what I've tried to do, combine the street ethic and the working heart of my father and mother with the ability to get an education to parlay that into something substantial. Well, let me just say thank you. And certainly you have given me enough to parlay uh, a strong message going to Andre because I think he set it up well for me, Andre, when you talk about taking it from the streets. Certainly we've had 401 years of agony as enslaved black folks came to this country and was put into slavery. Certainly like them, like Michael Dyson and his family, we know agony all too well, but having a younger brother on here like you will tell us about the actions from working hard, from being able to leverage what our family has provided for us. Michael's family instilled a lot in him. I know a little bit about your family with your mother, who was very much a hard worker, like your father, Michael, started at General Motors and decided she wanted more and became an entrepreneur. So we'll toss it over to you, Andre, with the same question. Thank you so much. This was a perfect segue. Uh, me and Dr. Dyson have some or, or a lot of commonalities. For one, I'm the second brokers panelist uh, in this discussion today. Uh, but unlike Dr. Dyson, I am the lowest uh, when it comes to being distinguished. So I do want to give my appreciation to you, Congresswoman Beatty, for allowing me the opportunity to sit on this panel with all these distinguished guests here. And I look forward to hearing everybody's stories today. There's three criti critical lessons that I wanna discuss before I even get into my agony to action story, um, which deals with a lot of agony, but you'll see how, how I use agony to turn it around to success. Uh, the number one lesson I've learned in life, exposure is key. 
I used to have a boss, my favorite boss, his name is Eric James, works at Ford Motor Company. He used to always tell me, you can either get exposure, Andre, or you'll get exposed. Um, and if you can't understand that, then you guys need to get a better boss, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and number two, uh, you will fail. At times you're gonna fail. However, we don't take losses, ladies and gentlemen. We don't take L's. We always learn a lesson, okay? So turn your losses into lessons and you'll be okay. Number three, don't miss the opportunity to build relationships with strangers just because loved ones have let you down. I know many times we feel that because we can't depend on those who are in our life as our family or close friends, they've let us down and we don't wanna let strangers in our lives. I've had some of the, some of the uh, uh, biggest opportunities come from strangers that I've built relationships with throughout my lifetime. All right, so um, just to get into, into my story, my agony to action story, um, just starting off, before I turned two years old, my father was killed. Uh, so I grew up in a household and never even, um, from, from the time I can remember, um, I, I don't remember having a two-parent household. My mother, she raised me and my brother. My brother was handicapped, by the way. Uh, my mom, she never let us feel like we were disadvantaged at all. My mom always preached um, uh, for us to pursue getting a good education and always made sure we were exposed to, to great people, exposed around black kings and queens who always excel for the best. Kings and queens that were, that were striving for the best in their industries, um, uh, black business leaders, black politicians, um, you know, just, just black professionals in general. And that allowed me to build up a confidence in myself since I was young to know that anything I put my mind to, I can definitely achieve. Uh, <clears throat> so fast forward many, many years uh, from, from me being a child and being exposed to all these folks. Um, after I graduated from Michigan State University, I was fired from my first job at age 21. It, that's, that's not a big deal, but when that's your first job, some people get down on themselves, which I never allow myself to do. Anytime that I'm faced with adversity or rejection, I use that to fuel the fire inside of me. So uh, back then, mortgages, the, the mortgage industry um, was, was performing very well. So I decided to start selling mortgages. I really was terrible at selling mortgages. I mean, I sucked at selling mortgages. But one thing I was good at was building relationships. I built relationships with professional athletes, relationships with investors in, real, in the real estate industry, um, and also developers. And I ended up buying my first home in partnership with an NFL player at age 22. From by the time I was 23, I had amassed over a million dollars worth of real estate in my name and thought that I would never work for anybody else in my life again. I mean, I was taking trips to Miami every month. I knew people in, in, in retail stores in Miami. And I, I actually opened up an online retail store when I was 23 as well. Never worked for any, any large company um, uh, that, that taught me the principles of, of business. Um, uh, so I really didn't have any good training to even own my own business like that. But, you know, you're young and uh, I was about pursuing my dreams and, and those are my dreams. And I really didn't look back. By the time I was 24, the housing market took a crash. I was literally, um, I, I was literally uh, about to file for bankruptcy and needed an exit strategy to get out of where I was at. So I decided to go back to school and that's when I enrolled in the Clark Atlanta University to pursue my, to pursue my MBA. So at 25, um, pursuing my MBA and started a, a marketing company while I was in grad school called Mint Marketing Agency. We created web-based marketing and tech solutions for clients. And actually, I became a member of the NMSDC, the National Minority Supply Development Council, in which you're going to hear more about um, as one of our panelists is the CEO, uh, the current CEO of the M NMSDC. Uh, at 26, graduated from Clark Atlanta and got a job with Ford Motor Company, who really gave me uh, the business acumen, the skill set, um, and, and polished me to become the businessman that I am today, um, which I am very thankful for. Uh, a, a few years into Ford Motor Company, I decided to go and work at a McDonald's just on the weekends. Um, and this was back in 2014 because my mom 
she had already uh, started her journey as a McDonald's owner operator. Um, and I said, well, I can't let this opportunity pass me by. I'm, I'm, I'm an advocate of building generational wealth. And when my mom had this opportunity ahead of us where I could pass a business down for many years to come that will help my family out, uh, I had to take the opportunity. So I decided to, to work for a McDonald's organization in Detroit. It was a black owned McDonald's organization, uh, the Throwers. And they had a they had a 26 year old second gen that was going through the program. Um, when I saw how how uh, dedicated she was to the business, when I saw how mature she was at the age 26, and I was a couple years older than her at that point in time, you know, it made me really step up and understand the benefits of being able to to take this uh, this business by the horns and run with it for my mom alone. I mean, she she was running a multi-million dollar business by herself. And it is it is very, very difficult to run a McDonald's no matter what people think or what people tell you. Uh, and so I decided to leave for a motor company uh, at the age of 31 back in 2016. And here I am today, uh, just became an owner operator uh, back in 2019. And like I said, you know, I, I, I've been down a lot, but I ensure that um, I use those opportunities to make myself better. Anytime somebody rejects me, anytime I, I have failure, I look at myself, pick myself up, you know, by my own bootstraps, figure out what I did wrong and use that as leverage as I continue to move forward and build progress. Well, let me just tell you, you got a lot of that. Uh, not only from our panelists, but from those who are watching. And I think there is a, a lot of lessons that I have learned listening to Dr. Dyson and also listening to you, Andre, and that is opportunity and exposure. And it also tells us that you can't ever give up and everything's not always going to be easy. And we're not all in corporate America per se. But for the audience, I want to clarify something. Multi-million dollar company that he has partnership and ownership in uh, with a franchise, 20 uh, books on all of those talk shows, uh, people flying Dr. Dyson all over the country. That poverty thing is a lot uh, relative. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that. We've heard uh, people make mention of corporate America. We've talked about opportunities, the lack of diversity, the lack of equity, the lack of having all of that power behind you. So I am very excited, Marla, to toss it to you to tell us your from agony to action and what might be of interest to our audience. No, absolutely. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'm really excited to be a part of this, part of such a fantastic and impressive panel, and look forward to, to learning more and, and hearing all of you uh, share more of your stories. I'll talk a little bit about a business I built before joining MasterCard. And, and uh, about six, seven years ago, I started a company called FS Card, which was a credit card company focused on offering traditional credit to underserved consumers. And in order to build that business, I needed capital. So a lot of, of what Dr. Dyson and what Andre talked about apply to, to my travels as, a, as an entrepreneur. And focusing in on moving people out of payday loans, out of problematic credit products and into traditional credit options based on deploying technology, my own understanding of having been in consumer finance for at that point, probably 10 years or so and bringing together all of that, all of those relationships to build this organization. And got all the way to the days of, of needing, you know, having set the table, having put together all of the relationships, have the ability to go to market, needing the capital to be able to pull that off. And so off I went to go and talk about money and all the capital that we were gonna need to the ecosystem that allocates capital in this country. I learned how to pitch. I learned how to sell. I pitched FS Card upwards of 150 times, trying to find someone that would get interested in, in backing a business like this. Over and over and over again, pitched exclusively to white men. There was maybe the occasional Asian man on the other side of the table, but I pitched to zero women. I pitched to zero black folks. 
basically zero people of color throughout that entire journey. Uh, in the end, the only way I was able to actually get that done is I got in contact with someone that I had known previously in my career, who's now a very senior professional at a large fund. He effectively vouched for me and got them to make an exception to their rule about what kinds of businesses they typically write checks to. Uh, and they wrote me a $10 million check to get this business off the ground. And we went forward from there, thank you, and got ourselves in market issuing credit to underserved consumers. Um, as you would expect, we ran into every imaginable problem from, from some of the credit not performing exactly what we wanted, from people on the team not being able to to deliver on what we had signed up for. We hit all the same roadblocks that, that any business hit. And we constantly had to feed the capital machine. This is a credit, in, you know, credit is a capital intensive business. So had to find incremental equity, incremental debt, bring down the cost of debt, keep going back and forth to this well. And again and again and again, having to explain to the capital providing space who can't really contemplate that there are people that don't have traditional credit, right? They're, the world view is incredibly concentrated in a small group of people who could not figure out like, who are these people that you're offering credit to? Don't we live in a world where everybody already has five figures of credit card debt and we're all trying to pay it down? What are you doing? Um, and I talked about the importance of parity, right? And creating opportunities for people to just have the exact same experience that the broad mainstream of America gets to have every single day. And I, but I quickly got to figure out if I have to educate you from the need of this population to writing me a check, that is a journey that we are not going to make, right? I had to figure out who was already sympathetic to it, who already understood this. Because for me, when I, the people that I'm trying to serve are people I love, right? This is, this is my family, this is my community. When I sit down at Thanksgiving at a family reunion, I got my family members turning to me saying, I'm in a bad car loan, I'm, I, I took out a thing that I can't afford, can you help me, right? So I'm, I'm doing it because I care about this population. And what I figured out is the same difficulty that this population has accessing credit is the same problem that we had as a business accessing capital, right? That this, that this is a circular issue, is a closed loop and trying to figure out how to break in and how to change it is, is very much one of the biggest contributors to perpetuating the wealth gap that, that Dr. Dyson started off talking about. So over the course of this journey, finding the right people who could, who could be bought in and understand that what we were putting in place is a fair offer of credit to this population. And I would get hammered with people saying, well, why don't you just charge a little bit more? Why don't you just add another fee? They are, you know, this is an inelastic population. They don't have a lot of choices. They're not going to go away because they don't have any other credit options. So you can just charge more. And the answer is, yeah, we can, except that we don't have to and we don't need to. And the point is not to hollow out this population, right? The point is to give them a fair deal and give them a fair shot and give them the opportunity to use credit the exact same way that I do, the way that I would have my mother do it, my sister, everybody that I know. And that was a constant battle to hold that line. So in the end, right, ended up building a big company, issued 120,000 cards, built up $50 million in outstandings sold it to another industry participant who is now up and running with the product today and got to sort of apply myself in terms of thinking about how to change some of this. And that's what led me to the work at, in social impact and joining the, the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth to drive change in exactly this space and try to figure out what we can do to make it possible for more people like me to get out there and have a shot, right? And, and go out and, and build a business and build a business that is focused on creating fairness and not about just creating as much profit as, as humanly possible at the expense of, of the end customer. So lots more to say about that. I will, I will leave it there, but um, that's, that was definitely my, my agony to, to action journey. Well, let me just say thank you so much. And it's very interesting how three entirely different people, different lifestyles have all talked about how we leverage, leverage from where we come, leverage how we get to where we are. But I want to say this before I toss it, Adrian, to you. I want to thank you for being able to marry corporate America, success, 
talk about $10 million as the first gift, but bring it back home to you all sitting around the Thanksgiving table talking about I'm upside down in that loan for that car I shouldn't have. Or how about auntie giving me a little loan? Uh, that, that is the thread through all of our families. But here's the thing about Black people. We know who we were born as, but we also know who we are born to be. And you just helped us understand that we are born to be what we've seen in Dr. Dyson, what we've seen in Andre Hill and you. And now I'm gonna to toss it to you, Adrian Tremble. I think it is a great segue for you because in your role, Corporate America, President and CEO, managing the expectations of those folks that Marla talked about in her dining room at Thanksgiving time. The stories that Andre talked about, not succeeding at first, but not giving up because he didn't wanna be exposed as the brother who couldn't make it. So he took the exposure route. And it sounds like he gave you some street creds for helping a young brother along the way. So I'm gonna to toss it to you to talk about you and what you do in your organization that helps brothers and sisters go from agony to action. Thank you, Congresswoman. And thank you for inviting me to be on this panel with these esteemed leaders. And just listening to their stories, it actually reminded me of, it's the inspiration of why I do the work that I do. You know, a number of people have asked me, you know, I left a 20 year career with Toyota to lead this organization. It was not an easy decision, but for me, it was a necessary decision because I was kind of at a crossroads. Because when you talk about the agony, I saw a lot of that on the corporate side. When you sit around those boardrooms, and Marla pointed this out, there is no one that looks like us sitting there. And those are the key decision makers. They are making decisions on where facilities and locations will be in, in across the country in terms of where jobs will be created. They decide what consumers are gonna be marketed to. They decide who's gonna help in the supply chain be a part of their business structure. They are making those decisions. And when there is no one inside those rooms that look like us or advocate for us, that's a problem. And that's why we are constantly excluded from the decision-making and the, and the impact of those decisions. So when you talk about what the NMSDC does, and thank you, Andre, so much for that plug about that. Um, NMSDC has been around since 1972, it was created as a, as a uh, partner to the Minority Business Development Agency out of the government entity to focus on minority business inclusion. And it's the corporate side of that. It was created by uh, chief procurement officers who said that they wanted to step up and uh, have a process to include minority businesses in their, in their buying decisions. Now, in my opinion, let's not get it twisted. This wasn't just some good hearted people saying we wanna reach out to the black and brown communities. These are people saying this is about economic development. When you look at the impact of, of creating companies and firms that are owned by people of color specifically, it is because studies have shown that people of color hire those who look like them 80% of the time. So that, that creates jobs in, in communities that have traditionally been underserved and underrepresented, and it gives a, a community the ability to create disposable and discretionary income to purchase their goods and services. So this is about creating income in areas that will help be able to purchase goods and services from them. So this is not some goodwill, social change uh, type of initiative. It really is about economic development. It goes back to what Reverend Jesse Jackson has said repeatedly. You don't know how good the, how good the game can be until everybody gets to play. When, when, the, when Major League Baseball integrated, it wasn't integrated because they said, oh, we want to bring the Black people over into the stands and, and we want them to play because we think they are really talented and we want to make sure we're being inclusive. It was about the economics. They looked over and saw those stands with people in them saying, we need those people to come over here and, and we want so we get access to that money. It's the same concept with NMSDC, work with these corporations who are making a commitment to diversify their supply chains. It's a business, business rationale that says, this is the way to get money and discretionary and disposable income into communities that have traditionally been underserved. So when you think about the work that we do, we have 23 councils across the country and we have one mission, connect corporate America to minority businesses. What my agony to action rationale is for why I'm doing the work that I'm doing is as I looked over what's happened over probably the last decade or so, this whole field of diversity and inclusion has become so diluted. 
all of a sudden it's no longer about minority. It's about everything, including in diversity now, is almost everything except for straight white men, straight white bodily abled men. So you have women that's involved now, you have LGBT, you have service veterans. I'm not saying that's bad, but what I'm saying is that it's diluted the ability to really focus on the advancement of minority business development. And it's become problematic because as you can see what happened with COVID-19, and you see now what happens with the racial, uh, racial justice calls, black businesses are impacted to a far greater degree than any other business sector. So what do we need to do to help ensure that we're preparing those businesses for success, that we're developing them, we're getting the resources. We know that the access to capital is an issue. And, and Marla, I just thank you for your willingness to actually focus on that because it is such a critical need because you're right, when we, when we found through COVID-19, black businesses didn't have the banking relationships that were necessary to get access to the capital. And guess what? Since May of 2020, over 40% of them have gone out of business, shut their doors. That is a significant number. And, and so those are the types of things that, are, that, are, that we understand now that if we don't have solutions to address them, these, these businesses won't come back, which means these jobs won't come back, which means the unemployment rates will continue to increase. It is a vicious cycle. So we know that we have got to have a way to get equity into uh, capital into the hands of our, of our black businesses. We at NMSDC, we said the Calvary's not coming. We saw the first round of stimulus money come and go. Black businesses didn't get it, got very little of it. We said, we're going to stand up and take care of our own. We partnered, we have a business consortium fund that is the funding arm of NMSDC. We partnered with the bank and we started providing PPP loans directly to those who were unbanked, who were not getting calls back from financial institutions, who were, who, who were really struggling to even get anyone to respond to their applications. We took that responsibility and said, we're gonna take care of our own businesses because we need them to be sustainable and we need them to be ready so that when we get through this economic downturn, they are positioned to be able to continue doing business with corporate America and continue to creating jobs and access for people within our communities. So that's my agony to action story and why this work is so important for me and why I decided to walk away from a 20 year career in Toyota to focus on this because it is about the next generation of entrepreneurs. So I look at folks like Andre and I'm like, we need more of this. When you look at our communities and when they were prosperous, it's because we were taking care of our own. And that's when I'm back to help our corporations do. Thank you so much for that. And what a great segue. I've been told that we have to go into what I'm gonna call the rapid round. Uh, we've had a wonderful time. I have another question I wanna get in, but you're only gonna have two minutes to answer this question. So we've heard a lot about the lack of capital. We've heard about equity. We've heard about opportunities and exposure. Let's bring it home now with all the racial injustices with me as a member of Congress saying racism is a national crisis. As black people, tell me in two minutes what you want to say to the audience of thousands of people out there about how we eradicate racism, how we fight racism, how do we get that capital. We know that Black Lives Matter. We're hearing it on Wall Street and Main Street. So no rules to this question. Just give a closing statement as a black woman, as a black man. And we're going to go Marla, and then we're going to go to Adrian, Andre, and Michael, you're going to close us out. The clock is ticking. Two minutes, Marla. Thank you. So keeping it brief, we have to change who is making decisions in this country. Adrian referenced it in what she was talking about on who's in the room, right? We can quote Hamilton, right? I want to be in the room where it happened, right? We have to get ourselves to the place where we're sitting across the table from people that do experience and relate to a much broader swath of this society. In the pension and, and big public capital arena, they are aggregating capital from the American people, the American people that look like the rainbow that we represent. And they are then allocating that capital to people to make decisions for them that represent a tiny slice of who's in this country. That is where this has to start. This is about ensuring that when you are contributing to a pension, if you are a public employee, you're a teacher, you are in some way participating in that in that sector by contributing your capital that you are holding them to account on how they then make decisions and distribute that capital out from there we are it is not just about changing how we are perceived and that people were willing to write a check to me because somebody happened to be able to vouch for me that is not that's that is not the answer what has to happen is in those 199 times i pitched fs card before i point i finally got to a yes I need to be pitching to different kinds of people, right? I need to be okay. pitching 
We're going to ask you to hold on uh, that thought. And speaking of pitching, we're going to go to you, Adrian. Two minutes. Absolutely. Thank you, Congresswoman. I think it has to start with, you know, our, our economy is driven by corporate America. It's about the green. So in terms of being able to decide how do we strengthen our communities, it has to go back to making sure we have the right people in the room influencing and making those decisions. There was a report that just came out from Forbes that said that in 28, 2019, there was, there was uh, no women of color running Fortune 500 companies. When you look at the boards of directors, there is nobody that is represented at a, at a significant level that represents black and brown people. Until that changes, until we have intentional strategies to change the makeup of what those boardrooms look like, we're gonna to continue to have these conversations. So there has to be an effort where we are holding these corporations accountable for making sure that they are representing the full demographic of this of the US. And I think until that happens, that's, where, that's what's gonna help us with, with real change. And as Shirley Chisholm said, until we are invited to the table, we need to continue bringing our own chairs and invade those rooms and hold those rooms accountable and have more transparency about what they're doing and what they're not doing so that we can make sure that we are not still having these conversations five, 10, 15 years from now when we know that the US demographic is going to become a minority majority population in this country. We've got to get ready I'm for that. I'm going to ask now. you to hold on on that point because it gives me a, a great segue when we talk about change, when we talk about being intentional, when we look at 51 million people have filed for unemployment, when we look at 41 percent of African-American businesses have been affected by this health pandemic we're in with COVID-19. So tell us, in the midst of all this as a young brother, two minutes, what do you want to say? In two minutes, I want, I want you guys, well, I want to say, I believe that creating partnerships with Fortune 500 companies in order to help provide our kids, our black and brown kids, with specific skill sets to pipeline them into those corporations is the best way for us to make sure our kids will have jobs and careers uh, for many, many more years, which will in increase equity within our own community. How do we do that? Um, if you look at McDonald's, they are big proponents of tech as well. They've, they've contributed thousands of dollars to programs, one of them being the Dream Hustle Co. program in Chicago, which they donated uh, money to um, the, the program trains kids on, on programming or coding. Uh, something I, that I personally want to do myself is, is establish a training in which I can take high school kids and um, uh, build partnerships with companies such as General Motors, Ford, Toyota, where they give us um, uh, guidelines in which we, we train kids on tech, how to, how to build computer systems, you know, how to program, how to code. And uh, with, that, with that program, we can pipeline those kids into these huge Fortune 500 companies and make sure that they have jobs when they come out of high school. I think uh, not pushing college as much, but building a skill set where these kids can ensure that they will have a job no matter what, I think is the best way to um, enable us to be able to build uh, uh, equity within our community. Thank you. Speaking of building equity in our community, when we look at the black unemployment rate being 14.6%, someone uh, earlier, I think Dr. Dyson, you talked about housing. When we look at black owned businesses, 41% of them closing in part because of the pandemic, in part because not getting capital, not having enough equity. Let me also say black women, having two powerful black women, I have to remind our audience that black women still make 62 cents for every dollar earned by their white male counterparts. When we look at where we are today, racism still exists. We are affected disproportionately, whether it's COVID, whether it is social injustices. That's why we have young people and other people taking it to the streets because we know Black families have one-tenth the wealth of their white counterparts. Black home ownership rate is 44%. And we know it was 41% in 1968 when we passed the Fair Housing Act, Civil Rights Act, Equal Rights Act of the 60s. Here we are today, same stories, same battles, and yes, 
attacking us on the most powerful thing we have, and that is our vote. So I needed to get that in for my two minutes, and we're going to let you close it out before I say thank you, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. Well, thank you so much, Congresswoman Beatty. Let me just take the names of the people on this panel and sum up what we're at. I tremble when I look at the racial mountain that we confront. I tremble in the face of the racist resistance to our organized protests. But I know that we've got to move up this hill. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep trudging. We've got to keep marching like the myth of Sisyphus, pushing that boulder up that hill because we don't want to blow it. And we will not blow it if we are determined to make certain that we use every economic, social, political access that we have to make sure that we vote on the right day, that despite the attempt to keep us and block us from the post office, from getting out there and dimpling that chat and pulling that lever, we have got to vote. Because in the end, like Joyce or Warren Beatty, we got to act right. We got to act like we got some sense. We got to act like we know what we're doing. And we got to act like we come from a great people. Because guess what? We do come from a great people. Like a Trojan horse, we are brought in as a gift and they celebrate us and then we let out all of those other uncles and aunties and cousins and everybody that we bring with us so that the beauty and the bounty of our struggle will be their, theirs as well. God bless all of you and thank you so much for this great opportunity. Well, let me end by saying, if you don't know, now you know. And we appreciate all of your stories, all of the information you have provided to take us from agony to action. This is so important because this is our 49th year of the Congressional Black Caucus's Foundation's annual legislative conference. Next year, our 50th anniversary. We hope to be able to come to you live in celebrating that hill that we've climbed. We know we won't blow it because we've got Adrian Tremble, we've got Andre Hill, we've got Marla Blow, and thank you for having you, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. And yes, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve this message. Thank you.